Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. guys how are we doing doing well Woo. good to see y'all you guys excited for the game tonight who all who all is coming back here anyone okay one two nice <laughs> well it'll be it'll be a great game I'm sure guys if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet my name is Asher Fraley I get the privilege on serving on staff with the pack and I am super excited to be here with you this morning and to be opening up Opening up, opening up God's Word alongside of you. If you haven't been with us, uh, we're going to be in the book of James. That's where we've kind of been this semester, and we're going to take the next step in that journey. Uh, so if you've got a copy of the scriptures with you, I want to go ahead and invite you to turn with me to James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. This is really where we will reside for the majority of our time there. And while, while you're flipping over there... Um, just want to give you kind of a 30-second recap so that we can see how our passage today connects with where we've been. If you were here last week, Nathan preached, and he had kind of this outline that he showed us, these three, really highlighting the three different arguments that James has made so far in his debut chapter. And the first argument that James makes is this idea about trials, and it can really be summed up uh, in, in kind of the short sentence that Trials, testing, and steadfastness. Those are kind of the three attributes that he explores. And James essentially drops this extremely uh, counterintuitive view of trials. And he says that rather than lamenting in the difficulties that we're given, we should actually have joy. And the reason for that is found in the fact that God is, he's using that trial. He's presenting us with that hardship for the purpose of our growth, to mature us more into the image of Christ. It's really for our good. And that's exactly how he starts out his argument again here in verse 12. And so if you're there in your Bibles, we'll have it up on the screen here too. Go ahead and read this along with me. Verse 12, James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let's go ahead and just stop there for just a sec before we move on. Because as James is transitioning to his next point that he's going to make in today's passage, he opens up just by reiterating what he really already said in verse 2. And we've actually got both verses so you can kind of see the comparison between them. Verse 2, he says in chapter 1, count it all joy when you go through trials and then Here in verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. He's just reestablishing that point that trials lead to a blessing if you remain steadfast and obedient to Christ through the trial. But then he switches gears because his goal, it's not to just repeat what he's already said. He he doesn't want to just make that same argument again. He's restating this because he wants to add a new facet to this argument, a critical ingredient that's necessary for us to understand. And we see that in verse 13. So let's continue. 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so James changes lanes here. And he starts talking about temptation. But we know that the context that he's talking about this in is in relation to trials. And so you might be asking the question, what does temptation have to do with trials? How are those connected? What's the relationship there? And I would put before you that they are actually far more related than we might intrinsically think. And let me give you a couple examples so you can know what I'm talking about here. Let's say that you uh, show up for your macro econ final. You've been in macro econ this semester and I mean, 
who are we kidding? It's tough. So it's not been a pretty semester. And you take one look at the test that the TA hands you, and you know that it's going to be a rough couple of hours. That's a trial, a trial in your life, a, a unique, difficult circumstance. But then you go sit down, and you, you take a look to your right, and you observe, man, this guy sitting next to me, he doesn't seem to be having any problems with his test. He's just blowing through it already. And in that moment, the thought might come into your mind, man, this is so dumb. Why am I even taking this class? I'm, I'm not even an econ major. I'm literally never going to use any of this information in the real world. I mean, come on, all of us have had that thought in some class we've been taking. And you might be thinking, surely it wouldn't hurt if I just get a better look at his Scantron answers. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you really enjoy macroecon. Hats off to you. Uh, maybe something that hits more close to home is that you're feeling alone. Like everyone around you is in these awesome relationships, but for some reason it just doesn't seem to be working out for you. That's a trial. And you're busy, you know, you can be busy crushing it throughout the day and you can keep your mind off of it, but when you come home at the end of the day and all of your roommates are out on a date and you find yourself alone on the couch watching Marley and me for the third time that month, the thought might come into your mind, maybe I should lower my standards on what I look for in a godly spouse. Or maybe if I relaxed my convictions on boundaries in the relationship, I wouldn't be sitting here alone on a Friday evening. One of my favorite quotes, uh, this comes from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. That's my favorite of the series. And at the end of it, after everything that's happened in the graveyard, Dumbledore's having this conversation with Harry, and he tells him, Harry, dark and difficult times lie ahead. Soon we all must face the choice between doing what is right and doing what is easy. And this is the choice that each of us are faced with in the midst of a trial when God brings difficult circumstances into your life for the purpose of growing us. We stand at the fork in the road where one side is doing what's right in God's eyes. And oftentimes that's the hard choice. And then the other side is doing what's easy, cheating on the test compromising your convictions on purity in the relationship. Because you see, every trial has a temptation that comes along with it, an easy way out, a coping mechanism, a way to siphon off the pain. And in the moment, all of these will seem right. They'll seem good, probably even justified. Solomon, the son of King David, in the Proverbs, he will say, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And this is the warning that James has for us today. He's already shared that God can use that trial to produce in you a unique kind of good. It can be a blessing in your life if you remain obedient and steadfast through it. And then now he's going to say, but there's another outcome. There's another choice which looks good in the moment, but in the end, it leads to death. And so we want to be rightly armed, rightly armed with how to navigate the trials in our lives because the reality is, is that if you're human, you're going to face hundreds, if not thousands of trials throughout the course of your life. These are things that all of us are going to face. None of us escape difficulties. None of us escape trials. So how do we do it well? How do we go about the trials that we're given in a way that leads to our flourishing, not our destruction? And that's exactly what James wants to exhort us with t today. And he's going to do that essentially by answering three critical questions. Three questions that we've got to have answered if we're going to navigate trials well throughout our life. And so question number one, jumping right in, the first thing that he asks us, it's pretty simple. Where does it come from? When I'm in the midst of a trial, where does the temptation, the temptation to act contrary to God's desire for me, where does that come from? Let's look at our passage. James 1, verse 13. James says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So right off the bat, James says, temptation, it doesn't come from God. And so we need to ask the question, well, why does he start with that? Like, that's a little bit of a, it's an interesting thing to start the bat off with. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. And the reason why I think that James starts there is because we so often blame God for how we respond amidst the trials that we were given, abdicating responsibility to God for how we acted. Let me, let me give you an example. In fact, we've been doing this ever since the very first trial. So I'm gonna, let me take you back in time, all the way back to the creation of the world. God creates the world and everything in it, and then on the sixth day, he makes man, Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the Garden of Eden. It's this utter paradise. God gives them literally every good thing under the sun, and then he even gives them the greatest gift of all, which is fellowship with himself. They were in right fellowship with God in the garden. And, and that's critical to understand because it shows us they weren't lacking anything. They had no need. God had given them all these good things, but then also, also God gives them a test, a trial. And he tells them a single command, every tree in the garden is yours to eat from all but one. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And then along comes the serpent, Satan. And he begins to tempt Eve, and he pours out all of his subtlety, all of his manipulation, and slowly eats away at Eve's confidence until eventually she reaches out a hand and takes the fruit, and she eats it. And then she gives some to Adam, who was there with her. And then God shows up. He comes in on the scene. And he finds Adam and he says, what'd you do? Did you eat the fruit? And let's look at how Adam replies. Let's look at what he says. This is from Genesis 3, verse 12. Adam says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. So what's Adam doing? Well, the obvious thing is that he is shifting blame onto Eve. Yeah, she's the one who gave me the fruit and I ate. But I want to put before you that that's not the only thing he's doing. Look at how he phrases it. The woman whom you gave me. You're the one who gave me Eve, God. You're the one who did this. Things were kosher when it was just you and I. You're the one who's responsible for what I did. And we've been doing this ever since, shifting the liability onto God as a means of self-justifying our actions amidst the trials that were given. And James is here to tell us today, don't do that. God is not the one responsible for what you did. He did not give you the temptation. God will absolutely give you the trial. That's for your good. It's for your flourishing and maturing. But the temptation to take the easy way out, to act contrary to God's will, that doesn't come from God. It has a different source. And if it doesn't come from up above, where is it from? Let's go back to our passage again. Starting again in verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted... I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Where does it come from? James says real plainly, it comes from you. It comes from you. And now you might be thinking, well, no it doesn't, Asher. You literally just told us that Satan tempted Eve in the garden. You told us Satan was the one who comes in the picture and he starts this conversation and he's the one that's luring and alluring, tempting Eve to take the fruit. And, and I get that. There's validity in that. But let me show you a closer look at really kind of what happens there. And this is from Genesis 3 again. This is right after Satan has tempted Eve. And this is verse 6. It's just a few verses ahead of where we were before. 
It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So did Satan have a voice in the temptation? Absolutely he did. But notice, whose desire was it that ultimately lured Eve to eat from the tree? It was her own. She saw that it was good for food and desired to make one wise. So you see, outside sources, things that impact our lives, people around us, other things that are going on in our context, they will absolutely have an impact on the temptations that we have but the desire to act upon it, the will to commit the sin, whoever makes the final decision to go down that path, it comes from nowhere other than us. So we've asked the first question, where does it come from? And James has turned our gaze upstream and taken us to the source so that we can see there's only one fountainhead of temptation, and that comes from our own hearts. And now he's going to ask the natural follow-up question, which is, if that's where it comes from, where does it lead? Where does the temptation go? Let's go back to our passage in James, and I'm actually going to start in verse 14 so that we can see how it connects. James says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Verse 15 then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so the short answer is death. That's where it goes. But before we just check off the box and kind of move along here, this one sentence from James really contains a gold mine of instruction. And so let's attempt to plumb farther down to see what else we can glean from this passage. And the first thing that I want you to notice here is look at the imagery. It's kind of the birth and life, kind of the coming age of a child, right? He says, sins, it's conceived, gives birth to uh, gives birth to sin, sin was fully grown. He's, he's talking about the growing up of someone. That's the imagery that he's using. And so James is actually using something that is of such immense joy, but he's using it as a metaphor to illustrate the true depravity of our sin. And so you're getting this picture, right, of the, the patient expectance, the waiting of a child, a new life to be brought into the world, and you're waiting and you're excited and you're eager, and then, plot twist, it's actually your sin, and it leads to death. And you might be thinking, like, oh, why is he doing that? Like, that, that's kind of messed up. And I think that that's the point. Because it's meant to jar us out of the comfortable, the easy stupor of our own temptation so that we can see through the fog to where it leads. So Hamilton, the play that took the Broadway world by storm within the last decade. Alexander Hamilton, he's this young, brilliant congressman from New York City climbing the bureaucratic ladder and in the second half of the story after the war is over he's given a hard political task by George Washington by the president that's a trial a difficult circumstance in his life and as his hair is turning gray trying to figure out the solution who walks in Miss Mariah Reynolds and don't worry, I'm not going to sing the song for you. That would just be an absolute disaster. Um, but I'll paraphrase the story. So what happens? While his wife and kids are upstate visiting her father in Albany, he commits adultery with Miss Reynolds. And out of his shame, he does everything he can to try to cover it up, right? Try to sweep it under the rug. No one needs to know. But the truth has a funny way of being found out. And what happens in the end? His marriage gets severely damaged. His political career is left in shambles. And in the story, that sin, it ends up being the p- 
pivotal factor that eventually leads to the death of his son. He was alone. He was stressed. He was in a time of difficulty in the trial. And in a moment of weakness, he was presented with the fork in the road where one path was right to do what was harder and the other was easy. And he chose the path that he thought was going to make life better. But it ended up leading to destruction. He thought it was going to be life-giving, and it ended up being life-taking. And this is the lie that we've been believing ever since the very first trial. The lie which says, following that temptation will actually result in my best interest. I'm sure if I go down that road, it will lead to my good. Don't believe it. And I would guess that every one of us in here has been in a similar situation. You can probably think of an example in your own lives where we were standing at the fork in the road amidst a trial that God placed in our lives, and we chose the easy way out, and it was comfortable in the beginning, but in the end, it cost us. So what James is trying to do so urgently and lovingly here is have, he's pleading with us to peer behind the curtain so that we can see the honest truth of where our sin leads. So in the coming years, throughout the numerous trials that all of us are gonna face, when we're finding ourselves standing at the fork in the road and we have to make the choice between doing what is right and what is easy, James wants us to be equipped with the truth of, I know where it goes. I know it looks good now, and, and I know this, this path is harder, and this one is so alluring, but I've seen the full perspective. I know that that's where it leads. It ends up leading to my destruction, and armed with that reality, will be far less likely to take the first step in that direction. So James has zoomed us out so that we can have a full vantage of temptation. He's taken us all the way to its entry point, and he's shown us that it only has a single source, and that comes from our own hearts, and then he's followed it along the path all the way to its destination, showing us that it has a single outcome, our destruction, and now he's going to hone back in on where we're at right now, and he's gonna get real practical, and he wants to just answer one last question, how do we respond to this? What do I do now? How do I withstand the temptation in my life? And so for the remainder of our time today, we're just going to briefly look at three different ways that James wants us to respond to this truth. And right off the bat, first one, real simple, look in the mirror. Just look in the mirror. And here's what I mean by that. Have the integrity to recognize that the only one who's accountable for your actions is you. And guys, this, I mean, if we're just being honest, this takes a ton of humility to do. But it's necessary for growth to occur. Aaron Sorkin, he uh, um, has written tons of kind of well-known monologues over the last about three decades or so of cinema history in an opening monologue of a TV show called The Newsroom. He writes, the first step to solving any problem is recognizing that there is one. The first step to solving any problem is just recognizing that there is one. I think that that's true, and that's why James starts his exhortation with this argument of first importance. He wants us to take responsibility. That temptation, it didn't come from God. It came from us. Have the integrity to acknowledge that we're the source of that temptation. We can't blame anyone else. And guys, James's goal in this, it's not for us to feel, it, it isn't to beat us up, it's not so that we walk out of here kind of wallowing in self-deprecation, like, oh my goodness, I'm just so filthy. Rather, th the goal of this, of taking accountability, is so that growth can occur. Practically, what does this look like? It means that when God presents you with a unique trial, when you're going along your way and God uh, instrumentally places a 
difficult circumstance in your life for the purpose of your growth, don't take it as permission to take the easy way out. Because I think, the na- I'm, I'm thinking for myself here, my natural thought process is God has presented me with this trial and I see clearly the door that is an easy way out. So clearly God must be allowing me to take the easy way out. Don't do that. That allure to go contrary to God's will in your life, it only comes from my own sinful heart. Which leads to the second way that we respond to this truth. Number two, arm yourself with the truth you need to resist the temptation. Let's, uh, let's take a look at verses 16 and 17 from our passage. James will say, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Generally, generally speaking, I would argue that the reason for why we go down the path of temptation is rooted in a lie. And it's the lie that God is not for me, that God is against me. After all, God is the one who gave us the trial. He's the one who's placed this difficulty in my life. Clearly, God is no longer on my side. Obviously, God has abandoned me. He's not looking out for me. I've got to look out for myself now. And here's the thing, and and we all know this. The reality is is that there's going to be trials in our lives every every year, every month, quite literally every day with varying degree, varying weightiness. And these trials, for the most part, they will come and go. They'll have an entry point and and more than likely will have an exit point. Maybe one day it's the macro contest and maybe another day it's wrestling with singleness. But more than likely, trials will come and go. And it's totally possible that God might give you a trial that lasts for the longevity of your life. But for the majority, they will come in and out. But here's the thing, underneath all of these varying trials, there's actually one more, a more foundational trial, an enduring temptation that all the other trials are built upon. And this underlying temptation is the enticement to think ill of God. How did Satan tempt Eve in the garden? He starts with the simple question, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And it's a question not so much about the fruit, but about the character of God, the nature of God. And as he's tempting Eve, he spends less time focusing on how great the fruit is, and he spends more time seducing Eve to believe God is not a good God. He's not on your side. God is actually trying to rob you of potential joy in your life. The greatest temptation that you will ever face is the temptation to think ill of God. It's such an easy lie to believe, and that's why James starts with, don't be deceived. Everything good, everything perfect comes from God. The author of Hebrews will say that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. In chapter 11, verse six, the psalmist will write in Psalm 145, the Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. And Paul will say in Romans eight, if God is for us, who can be against us? The scriptures reverberate with the goodness of God. So what's the truth that you need to withstand the temptation, it's the truth to see through the lie that God is not a good God, that he doesn't have your best interest at heart. And to recognize the reality that the trial that he's given you is for your good and that the temptation to take the easy way out seems good in the moment, but in the end, it leads to destruction. And this brings us to our final application, our final response. Number three, set your delight in God. Let's go back to our passage one last time. James will say, uh, every good gift 
and every perfect gift is from above. This is what we just looked at. And I want you to notice that word gift. Because what that implies is that the, the good things that God gives, they weren't earned. They weren't merited, right? They were given. And the reason why I would argue that this is actually so critical is because, and I'll give you just kind of an example from my own life here. This is how I respond. When I'm complaining about the trials that God has given me, when God has brought in a unique difficulty in my life and my propensity is towards frustration, oh God, why'd you do that? Really what I'm saying is, God, I was entitled to the level of comfort that I had before this trial existed. The ease of my life before this present difficulty was what I deserved. And James is here to gently but truthfully remind us everything good, everything perfect, every good, every perfect gift, it's not deserved, it's freely given. If we were owed the gift, the sentence that James would have said is every good and every perfect payment, right? But he doesn't say that because what James is articulating here is something that we Golly, it's so hard. We, we do everything we can to not admit this, but it's the honest reality that everything good in our lives was freely given by God, which means that none of us can lay claim to anything and say, this is what I deserve. It's a perfect gift from God, which means that if God chooses to take away any earthly gift that he's given us, he is every perfect and supreme right to do so. And I don't think that we do this often enough, but even just as we're, we're sitting here thinking through this, just take a second to reflect on what has God given you? What are the good and perfect gifts that God has placed in your own life? A few examples just to get the ball rolling. You know, it's the morning here, and I would guess that probably most of us have either eaten breakfast before we came here, or maybe you're not a breakfast person and you're going to be on your way to get lunch or brunch of some sort after this. That food, that was a gift from God. The money in your bank account to buy that meal, that was a gift from God. If you were able to walk to church this morning, the fact that you have legs that can move and function, those legs and their ability, they were a gift from God. If you drove your car ability for transportation, same thing. If you can see, your vision is a gift from God. If you can hear, that ability is a gift from God. If you can smell, that's a gift from God. If you had shelter over your head last night as you slept, that was a gift from God. If you have a mind that is capable of cognitive thought, that's a gift from God. And guess what? Even the trial even the hardship is a gift from God. And if God chooses to take away any of these things, he would still be good and merciful and compassionate and righteous. And let me show you. Look at verse 18. James says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So James has told us we're not owed anything. We're not entitled to anything. Everything good in your life is a gift from God. And then he takes this concept all the way to its natural end. And he shows us the greatest gift of all, the gift to end all other gifts, which is fellowship with himself. And he says, God brought us forth of his own will which is a radically hope-filled message because it means that we were pursued by God while we were still sinners, while we were broken. If you're in Christ, it's not an accident that you were chosen by God. God didn't bring you into his family and then was like, whoa, that's how much sin you have? Oh my goodness, wish there was a refund policy. No, no, no. God knew exactly how broken we were. And it says in Hebrews out of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross not because he had to, 
but because he willingly chose to. And it was out of making a way for us to be united with him in eternity that with joy he endured the cross. And so relationship with Christ, that's a gift, freely and joyfully given by Jesus. And if you're in Christ, then that gift, the gift of new life in Christ, it's, it's unique in a couple ways. One, in the fact that it, it surpasses all other gifts. And then two, if you're in Christ, it will never be taken away. Let me show you, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure, this is Paul speaking, um, for I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you are in Christ, then that gift, the gift of fellowship with him, new life in Jesus, it is sealed and it will never be taken away. And I want to I want to say just real quick, maybe you're in this room today and and you're not in Christ. Maybe you would say I'm I'm not there yet. I'm still trying to figure out all of this stuff. Two things. One, I love that you're here. I love that you chose to come here today and worship alongside of us. And then the second thing I want you to know is that that gift the gift of fellowship with God that it truly is the greatest gift you could ever be given. The creature, that's us, we were created by God. The creature was designed for relationship with their creator. All other earthly pursuits, things that on this earth we pursue for the purpose of fulfillment, they will fall utterly short, proving themselves to be hollow. There is only one thing that can ultimately fulfill you, and that is a relationship with your maker. And this gift is available to you today, to any who would surrender their life to follow him, casting aside allegiance to self to take hold of that which is of infinitely greater worth, fellowship with God. But if you're here today, and you are in Christ. James's final encouragement for you, the truth that you need to thwart the temptation is to remember what you've been given. In the trial, amidst the temptation, in the moment of difficulty that God places in your life, choose to set your mind to remember what God has done for you, what he's given you, and then what's naturally going to arise out of that is gratitude. If you're in, in the moment of suffering, it's the, it's the least natural thing, it's, it's the most counterintuitive thing to be like, I'm going to choose to remember what I have been given and yet that is what James exhorts us to do today and it's because in that, what's going to arise is gratefulness and similarly to the words penned in the famous hymn by Helen Limmel in 1922, turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Strangely dim. In light of his glory and grace, as a sincere heart of gratitude increases and a fixing of your delight upon Christ, that temptation, the pull That's the voice that says, hey, take the easy way out. It will slowly lose its allure. And however long the trial lasts, God will give you the strength to endure it. Let's pray. Well, Lord in heaven, God, uh, we just want to recognize that you are the giver of all good gifts in our life including the trials and the storm and the difficult circumstances and how you use those for our growth and for our good to mature us and to mold us more into the image of Christ. And so, Father, we just want to submit ourselves to you 
to the work that you are doing through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that you would stir within us, uh, opening up our minds to see the big picture, the, the perspective that James has been um, arguing for us today, that we would see, I see that my temptation doesn't lead to life, but it leads away from life. And then out of that truth, that we would humbly set our eyes upon you, following you, however hard it is. We pray this with faith, in Jesus' name, amen.